I will be your moderator during the session today. The webinar soon will be given by Professor Marcos Lopez del Prado, the CIO of True Positive Technologies and Professor of Practice at the Cornell University School of Engineering. Marcus has over 20 years experience in developing investment strategies using machine learning and supercomputers. Marcus launched the True Positive Technologies after selling some of the patents to Acura Capital Management, where he was the principal and the, fir the firm's first head of um, machine learning. He also founded and led Guggenheim Partners quantitative investment strategy business. Um, Marcos is a research fellow at Lawrence Barclay National Laboratory and published dozens of scientific articles in leading academic journals. He is a co-founding, he is a founding co-editor of Journal of Data Science, and he also testified before the U.S. Congress on artificial intelligence policy. He has written several graduate textbooks. Some of you might be familiar with uh, advances in fashion in this, in uh, financial machine learning, which is a compulsory reading for people in my team. Uh, Marcos received Spanish National Award for Academic Excellence and the Quant of the Year Award from the Journal of Portfolio Management. He earned a PhD in financial economics and a PhD in mathematical finance from Universidad Complutense de Madrid and completed his postdoctoral research at Harvard University and Cornell University. So, with that long list of achievements, uh, Marcos will guide us today through the application of machine learning for portfolio constructions. Some of you might have experienced that classical, uh, class, classical statistics struggles with the complexity of economic systems. Fortunately, there are alternative methods that can help us solving those issues. Marcos will di discuss today the signal induced instability and demonstrate a new optimization method that can improve in, uh, performance. So before I transfer the microphone to Marcos, I would like to announce that the presentation by Marcos today will take approximately 20 minutes, which will be followed by another 20 minutes for Q&A. If you have any question during or after the presentation, please send it over through the chat function and we will tackle those questions during the Q&A. So with that, I'm handing over the microphone to Marcus. Please go ahead, Marcus. Thank you, Rani. Thank you for your kind words. And it's wonderful to be here. I'm excited about this presentation uh, because we're going to tackle some very important questions that we all face when we are building portfolios. Um, as you know, for over the past 60, 70 years, the prevalent uh, framework for portfolio construction has been uh, the Markovich framework, efficient frontier, convex optimization. This, is a, um, this was a wonderful, uh, very relevant step forward um, decades ago. And since then we have seen that there are a number of caveats, a number of problems involved with uh, convex optimization. Uh, in particular, convex optimization solutions tend to be unstable for two major reasons. Number one, noise included in the input variables, and number two, certain signal structures that are very common in finance that lead to instability in convex optimization solution. During this presentation, we are going to discuss in detail what are these two sources of instability and how can we tackle them utilizing machine learning. First, let's try to understand the problem. Um, in its simplest form, the problem of portfolio optimization is to compute what are, what are the weightings of a portfolio such that we minimize the risk of the portfolio subject to achieving a particular goal, where this goal is represented by a characteristic vector. For instance, in this equation, if we replace the vector A with the vector of expected returns, we will be computing the maximum sharp ratio portfolio. If we replace the vector A with um, an array of ones, we are going to be computing the minimum variance portfolio. Um, and typically one approach to this when we are dealing with um, constraints inequality, so equality constraints, we would apply a, a Lagrangian. Here the math is not particularly important. What I would like you to pay attention to is the last equation. The optimal weightings are the result of a multiplication of the inverse covariance matrix and the characteristic vector, for instance, the vector of expected returns. 
this operation is the one that is going to, to be um, numerically unstable and that is going to cause a lot of problems in terms of uh, unnecessary portfolio turnover, unnecessary transaction costs, unnecessary instability. First, let's discuss the most uh, uh, common, commonly understood uh, source of instability, and that's noise-induced instability. Um, we know that as a result of competition for alpha, the signal-to-noise ratio in finance is very low. If, uh, when there are very obvious investment opportunities, very quickly those opportunities disappear as a result of competition and crowded um, investment strategies. Uh, mathematically, this can be observed uh, very clearly when you con conduct a um, eigenvalue decomposition of a covariance matrix, whether it is an empirical covariance matrix or a factor-based covariance matrix like VARAS. Um, and on this plot, you can see how most of the eigenvalues associated with this covariance matrix will fall under the so-called marchenko pastor distribution. And only very few large eigenvalues fall outside the marchenko pastor distribution. And very typically in finance, we will find a wide gap between these two uh, clusters of eigenvalues. Well, the marchenko pastor distribution is the distribution associated with random covariance matrices. It, in other words, what this means is that the great majority of information included in a co financial covariance matrix is associated with noise, not with signal. It is the kind of information that you would expect from a completely random covariance matrix. Very few eigenvalues are associated with signal. They cannot be explained by random variability. And the first thing that we need to do is we need to tackle this huge amount of noise. If we leave this noise untreated, it's going to be garbage in, garbage out. And I want to restate that this analysis is conducted on a VARA covariance matrix. On an empirical covariance matrix, the, the result would be even more appalling. The idea of marchenko pastor is not that we know what is the maximum eigenvalue associated with noise, we can treat all of the eigenvalues that fall under the marchenko pastor distribution numerically. We can replace those values with their mean, for instance. Why? Because by replacing them with their mean, the minimum eigenvalue is going to be now pushed to the right, it's going to be higher. And that means that the condition number of the covariance matrix is going to be much lower, hence the greater stability. This can be visualized in this plot. What we are doing is for the eigenvalues that are very high, we leave them untouched. And uh, the blue line shows the eigenvalue distribution uh, for the untreated covariance matrix. And the orange line shows the eigenvalue distribution for the treated um, uh, covariance matrix. So as you can see, for those eigenvalues that are very high, we keep them as they are. And for the eigenvalues that fall under the, Mar the marchenko pastor distribution, we replace them with their mean. Why with their mean? Well, because in this case, the trace of the covariance matrix is unchanged. The covariance matrix is still uh, invertible, is still uh, positive, definite, etc. cetera. Um, so numerically, we achieve the goal that um, we are reducing noise while preserving most of the signal. In fact, all of the signal, as you can see from this plot. This is in contrast with a shrinkage. In a shrinkage transformations, what we do is we uh, move the entire uh, covariance matrix towards the diagonal. This means that we are removing a lot of noise, but also a lot of signal. Here, what we are doing is different. Essentially, what we are doing is we are shrinking only the eigenvalues associated with noise. We leave the signal the same. We don't change the signal, but we take the eigenvalues associated with noise, and that's what we shrink. So that's a much more surgical numerical method than uh, Ledois-Wolf and other shrinkage methods, which are 
wonderful mathematic, uh, mathematical tools, but they are a little bit indiscriminate when we are dealing with problems like financial covariance matrices where the signal to noise ratio is very low. How does this work? Please don't take my word for it. And no math can replace empirical evidence. So that's where we need to conduct Monte Carlo experiments. Why Monte Carlo experiments? Well, because this allows us to control for the uh, environmental variables, essentially for the conditions of the test. We could also run historical backtests, and that would give us good anecdotal evidence. Empirical, you know, a historical backtest is just going to show us the realization of a single path. And a Monte Carlo experiment is going to tell us much more, um, much more, it's going to provide us much more insight because we have control over the inputs and we see in, in what cases the uh, mathematical approach is more helpful. So the design of the experiment is as follows. We're going to take a covariance matrix, for instance, from Barra. We're going to sample uh, thousands of covariance matrices from, from this ground truth that comes from Barra. And for each of these thousands of covariance metrics, we can optimize, we can apply, you know, uh, Black, Lederman, Markovich, et cetera, and obtain um, an empirical vector of um, optimal weights. We can compare these 1,000 vectors of uh, empirical weights with the ground truth that comes from the original covariance matrix, and that allows us to compute um, the estimation error. This is a procedure that is very common in statistics, is very widely accepted. It is, a, it is the way to derive, essentially, to bootstrap the distribution of the estimation errors associated with, um, with this estimator of the efficient frontier. So let's see, let's look at the table. Um, once you repeat this experiment at home, again, you don't need to take my word for it, you can do it at home, you will see that um, the uh, denoise and uh, not a shrunk covariance matrix, so essentially just taking the covariance matrix from Barra and applying Markovich, uh, Markovich optimization, you will get a quite high, relatively high root mean of the, root mean of the square error. If you apply a shrinkage, it improves. The result is, is better, but not by much. The big improvement, of course, once you denoise. So if you denoise um, the covariance matrix and then apply Markovich, you obtain essentially a 60% reduction in the root mean square error. So that's much, that's essentially um, half of the error that you would obtain with uh, Ledois Wolf. How about if we, if we do this, we repeat this experiment with the maximum sharp ratio portfolio? Well, then the, the results are even more impressive. You obtain essentially a 94% reduction in the root mean square error. So, you know, if you're familiar with uh, mathematical approaches in finance, it's very rare to see a mathematical approach where you obtain this um, level of improvement. And there is no magic behind this. We know exactly why it's going to be better. Well, because when we are uh, treating the numerically the numerical instability of the covariance matrix, we invert that covariance matrix. And that means that the, the loadings of the covariance matrix do not explode. They are not, uh, they don't become um, uh, very, very large. And when we multiply that inverse covariance matrix with some um, um, imprecise uh, returns forecasts, these imprecise returns forecasts are not uh, maximized. So essentially what we are doing is by treating the covariance matrix numerically, now we are more resilient to our inaccuracy in forecasting returns. So that's why the result is so much better when we compute maximum sharp ratio portfolios than with minimum variance portfolios, right? Because with maximum sharp ratio portfolios, we are tackling directly that product that we saw in the second slide that was problematic. Let's discuss now the second source of instability. And this is a, a source of instability that typically is not discussed in the literature. Most of the literature deals with um, noise-induced instability. Why? Because uh, intuitively, we shouldn't be worried about signal, right? Signal is precisely what we are trying to extract. Um, and it appears at first um, non-intuitive that um, signal will be a source of problem. But it is. And 
the reason is very clear. Um, when you have um, off-diagonal elements in the correlation matrix, now it means that there are some variables that are very similar to each other. And when they are very similar to each other, but different from the rest, the optimizer cannot differentiate between them. This means that the optimizer becomes very sensitive to very small changes in the vector of expected returns. So this is what I call Markovich's course. And again, I have tremendous respect for uh, Markovich and his work. Um, what we're doing here is we're trying to improve on that work. Um, th the reason we needed Markovich in the first place is because we had off diagonal elements that were non-zero. If the correlation matrix is simply a diagonal matrix, then optimizing the portfolio will be trivial. We just need to do inverse variance allocation. The reason we needed Markovich is because the off-diagonal elements are non-zero. But this is precisely the reason that will make Markovich unstable. So th the more we need Markovich, the more likely is that Markovich is going to fail. And that's where machine learning comes in. And it helps us deal with this instability. How? We are going to cluster the covariance matrix. We are going to identify what are the variables that are more likely to, to be a substitute of each other. And then we're going to optimize each of these variables separately. Why? Because by doing so, we do not allow the instability to spread throughout the system. You see, when we optimize using Markovich, the covariance matrix is a complete graph. As a result, any variable has an impact on other variable. Whether the variable is similar or dissimilar, every variable will have an impact. And by um, containing this similarity, this source of instability, we are um, allowing a more robust estimate. So let me be a little bit more precise about what are the steps of this algorithm, the nested cluster algorithm. First, we cluster the correlation matrix. You can use the ONC algorithm or hierarchical clustering algorithm or k-means, the method of your uh, preference. And this is where you can experiment and try alternative methods uh, to see which one works for your particular problem. Um, once the matrix is clustered, we are going to compute intra-cluster weights. And the intra-cluster weights um, are computed by applying, for instance, Markovich or black Liederman, the method of your preference, on each cluster separately. So all of these um, vector of allocations are estimated in parallel. This allows us to reduce the system. Instead of working with an n by n system, where, where n is the number of variables, now we can work with a k by k system where k is the number of clusters. The beautiful mathematical property that emerges is that because we have clustered the covariance matrix, now the off diagonal elements are guaranteed to be much lower, right? If, if the clusters were highly correlated, then they would have emerged. The fact that clusters exist indicates that the clusters must be uncorrelated. Therefore, we can now reduce the system and apply intercluster weighting in a robust way. The final uh, result will be the dot product between the intercluster weights and the uh, intercluster weights. Um, why does this work? Well, uh, in theory, it should work because uh, we are transforming an ill post problem, a problem where we have many of diagonal elements that are um, uh, large in absolute value, we are uh, posing, we are transforming the problem to pose it in a in a well-behaved way. Where now, once you reduce the system to this, its clusters, the of diagonal elements are much closer to zero. So mathematically, this is why the method should work. But again, mathematics. Uh, doesn't, uh, it doesn't need to work in reality. It's, uh, it, it, uh, mathematics is not physics. We need to conduct experiments and see if this approach actually works. And again, the, the right way to do this is through Monte Carlo experiments um, because the backtest will only provide anecdotal evidence. It, we, the, we are going to repeat the exact uh, experiment we did before, so I won't go again through the steps. 
The only difference here is that instead of working with a, a 500 by 500 covariance matrix, I'm going to work with a, a smaller um, a covariance matrix. Why? Because I want to show you that the method works even with very small systems. Even with very small systems, signal induced instability is very problematic. With a 50 by 50 covariance matrix, you are already in trouble. What are the results? Well, the results are that, um, again, if you just apply Markovich, signal itself is going to lead to a very high root mean square error. If you, have like, if you apply a shrinkage, the result will be even worse. Let me repeat this. A shrinkage can be detrimental. Why? We know why. Because a shrinkage is not only removing noise, it's also removing signal. The, the algorithm I just described, the, the nested cluster optimization NCO algorithm, achieves a 47% reduction in the root mean square error when we estimate the minimum variance portfolio. And then the combination of the two, uh, a shrinkage and NCO, is in fact worse than NCO. Um, and it's about the same as Markovich itself. How about the um, maximum shard ratio portfolio? Essentially the same result, 55% re reduction in the root mean square error. Um, let me finalize with a comment on um, Monte Carlo optimization selection. Um, I don't think that there, there are algorithms that are superior in all cases. There is no such algorithmic supremacy. The point of my talk is not to promote a particular algorithm. I'm not claiming that NCO will defeat any other alternative in all cases. I'm presenting evidence that uh, through Monte Carlo experiments that NCO helps when you, in, in many cases, in a wide range of cases, the cases analyzed through the Monte Carlo experiment. However, I don't, I don't, I'm not making any claim that NCO is the best algorithm that there is, etc. In fact, what I'm suggesting is that given your input variables, given your, the, the covariance metrics that you get from Barra or any other system, and given the particular constraints that you are working with, you should repeat uh, these Monte Carlo experiments on many, many different algorithms where Markovich, Black, Liederman, NCO, and maximum diversification portfolio, hierarchical risk parity, all of the algorithms that you want to try, you compare them and you see what algorithms lead to a, a smaller estimation error given your input variables. So I believe that this, is, this kind of experimental approach is um, much more powerful than making mathematical assumptions that sometimes are satisfied, sometimes are not satisfied, sometimes can be verified, sometimes cannot be verified. Instead, take your input variables, conduct a Monte Carlo experiment, and apply the right tool for the job. There are many different algorithms. Many of them are valuable. There is no need to, to prefer one over the others. You should just experiment what is the best tool for the job that you have at hand. And that's essentially the, the, the process that you would follow. You take a, a particular input set. You denoise or not, depending on, um, on what the experiment uh, demonstrates is better. And you optimize using each of the methods. In a Monte Carlo, you record all of the results. And once you have all of the results, you can evaluate which is the uh, algorithm that leads to the best performance, and that's the right tool for the job. I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, if you are interested in these topics, I invite you to read uh, these two publications, Advances in Financial Machine Learning and my most recent book, Machine Learning for Asset Managers, where you can find the code and uh, a, a more detailed description of the methods that I just described. And with that, Rani, uh, I pass the mic back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcos. That was a very interesting uh, uh, presentation. I think uh, based on the questions that we got from the audience, we got tons of them and they're very good, very, very good questions. Uh, but before I start, it's actually uh, the thinking that some of us might have before joining this uh, 
presentation or this webinar is about this concept of machine learning for financial uh, industry for portfolio managements. Uh, how widespread is it? Uh, there are some fear as well, perhaps among practitioners that uh, the kind of portfolio management that was done by humans might be the thing of the past. And now it's slowly going to become more and more advanced, more by machine learning, by artificial intelligence type of uh, methodology. What is your thought on the widespread use of this new technique in portfolio management? I think everybody understands that um, data is the new oil and uh, the, the way to acquire an edge is either through data, better mathematical models or more powerful supercomputers. And if you can use the three, even better. Um, but definitely the, the only way to extract an edge is, is by modeling the data and, and um, identifying where the opportunities exist. Uh, and that's where machine learning helps us. Machine learning deals with unstructured data. Classical methods, even though useful, um, they do not deal with unstructured data. They, they, deal, they deal with the type of data sets that were in place when these methods were developed in the early 20th century, right? In the early 20th century, we would have um, a small tables of observations and they were with only a few hundred observations. That's why asymptotic theory was so important to Fisher and, and Neiman and Pearson, uh, etc. But now, today we have uh, powerful supercomputers, we have tremendous amounts of unstructured data, and we have the ability to experiment, you see? Today, we don't need to make very generic assumptions. Um, those assumptions were needed 50 years ago because we did not have the powerful computers, um, and, and therefore we needed to use a lot of math to find the answers, right? We, we did, as a matter of mathematical tractability, we had to compromise um, reality in a sense or, or um, realism with uh, making some crude assumptions. Today, we don't need to make these crude assumptions. As you can see from this presentation, I'm not claiming that there is an algorithm that is better than the rest. Uh, what I'm inviting the audience is take your data, try all algorithms and, and let the data find what is the best uh, tool for the job. And I think that's the future of finance rather than um, looking at some sort of particular approach, we should apl apply the better tool for the job uh, and machine learning is very helpful in that context. Yeah, so basically uh, data is the, the input for all this uh, the work that we're doing in, uh, in, in the investment management industry. As the data becomes more advanced, then we will need more advanced tools as well to be able to deal with them. Yes. Um, and then that, that uh, transport me to the, uh, the, the most liked question, by the way, uh, for the audience, I forgot to mention, but I think it's uh, quite obvious to all of you that you can like the questions that are posted by uh, participants in this webinar. So, uh, you know, then we can see which questions we can uh, prioritize. So the most liked question is actually about the transition onto this new world of uh, machine learning. So people who had more traditional growth path into this industry, um, what would you suggest for us who would like to learn more about machine learning? Well, it's a great moment in time to uh, learn these techniques. And you don't need to become a machine learning expert. Um, let me uh, explain why. Uh, financial markets are extremely complex. We need mathema complex mathematical tools to analyze the data. But um, black boxes are not good enough in finance. Why? Because the signal to noise ratio is too low. The number of false positives is, uh, is very high in finance. So Black box solutions will not help us in finance. We need to build theories. And the only way to build theories is to make sense of the data that we are analyzing through machine learning. So 
I believe that the way of the future is as follows. You have people who is specializing data. Let's call these individuals data curators. They know data um, back and forth, all, the, all of the difficulties of particular data sets, particular vendors, etc. And that's a job in its own. Then you have people with a very strong statistical mathematical background who are modeling this data. And these are you know, computer scientists, statisticians, mathematicians, et cetera, physicists, et cetera, who are going to look for patterns. They are going to look for potential cause effect mechanisms. And then you have the individuals. So let's call this second role feature analysis, okay? So we have data curators, feature analysis. And then we have the third role, a strategy developers. A strategy developer is someone who receives this, this, these pieces of the puzzle the, all of this collection of observations made by the feature analysts, and they need to build a theory, something that makes sense based on our understanding of the economy. Mathematicians cannot um, make physics on their own, right? Mathematicians work with physicists, and the same uh, happens with, it's, it's even more important in finance, mathematicians need to work with finance experts. And that's where the CFA program and other programs are very extremely helpful in the sense that they educate people for understanding what are the foundations of the economy, what is relevant, what is irrelevant, what variable, what um, cost effect mechanism is likely to, to be spurious. And they allow us to formulate theories. And once we have a theory, we can back test and we can test uh, in many different ways beyond backtesting whether uh, a particular theory is true or false. But let's not fool ourselves. Um, we, we need mathematicians to analyze the data. This is a, an extremely complex job that needs to be, that requires a specialization. And we need financial analysts to make sense of the evidence found by the mathematicians. So I think the way of the future is a specialization. We need to specialize people into these three different stages of the research process, data curation, feature analysis, strategy development. So uh, between this specialization, I would imagine that uh, they also still need to work closely together in order to have a smooth transition from one specialism to the other, because uh, sometimes uh, you know there can be also things that, is, that are lost in translation while the mathematicians work separately from the strategic builder. Absolutely, and and you see that in every scientific field, right? Um, biologists work very very closely with mathematicians, and and one cannot replace the other, right? A, mathemat a mathematician alone will produce nonsensical bio biological theories. And a biologist alone will be powerless in terms of analyzing the, the huge amount of data that comes from the genome, et cetera. And it's in this cooperation, this interdisciplinarity where the magic occurs and the greatest um, bio, biomedical advances have occurred. We need this sort of cooperation in finance, right? We need to, um, there is no more uh, quant versus fundamental in the future. In the future, we both are integrated and we need to be very good at both. Uh, this requires a specialization. I think that um, it is very important for um, financial analysts to understand the basics of how machine learning works, but they don't need to become machine learning experts. Just like mathematicians should, uh, need to understand the basics of the economy, but they can mm -hmm. never spend 20, 10, 20 years trying to understand the players and the mechanisms and, and uh, the rules and, and regulations and everything that uh, entails really having a grasp of financial markets. Yeah, so uh, with that, I'm moving to the uh, next question from our audience about the NCO algorithm that you uh, explained during your presentation. Do you consider? Do you think that this algorithm is here to say, is here to stay, and it will leave Markowitz portfolio optimization behind? Would it be able to instigate a genuine revolution in portfolio management? I think it, it's it's helpful, and that's uh, all we need, right? 
um, in, in finance, you need a small edge. And that's the difference between success and failure, right? Um, I don't, I don't um, uh, expect NCO to become uh, the new gold standard of if it becomes, that would be amazing. But that, that, that's not the point, right? The point is we just need to tackle the problems we have at hand. And, um, and we have good empirical evidence that uh, this algorithm works and, and performs as, um, uh, as expected. Um, so now that doesn't mean that is the, the final algorithm you will ever need, or that is, uh, uh, there, there is no mathematical claim that this is uh, the, the best possible algorithm. It is a step in the right direction. Okay. Yeah, I know we're moving to a bit more specific, uh, maybe a bit more technical questions from our audience. Which programming language is the best to create a machine learning uh, program for portfolio management? Uh, we know some of us use Python or R, or are there any other programs that you would um, suggest? Well, I've, I've learned personally, I've learned all. I think most uh, um, machine learning um, people learn Python and R, um, perhaps also Julia. Um, there are a number of uh, MATLAB. There are a number of uh, languages out there. If you have to pick one, it's important to become good at one, right? Um, at least make sure that you are good at Python. Um, R is a very useful um, language. However, um, the data structures are not as evolved as with Python. And um, data structures are the name of the game, as, at least in finance, right? So the flexibility of the data structures that you can find, for instance, in the Pandas library, it has no equivalent in R. That doesn't mean that R is not useful. R is amazingly useful. There are many useful libraries, but guess what? You can call R libraries from Python. So you can take a, a, a Python object, let's say a data frame, uh, there are, the, for instance, you can use the library rpy2 uh, to transform the object into an S3 object and send it to, to R. And that's pro programmatically. So what I'm, what I'm telling you is that even if you don't know R, you can use R as long as you are good with Python. So that's a very powerful um, you know, way of, of using the best of both worlds. Okay, and now um, on the methodology that you presented today, yeah, you use Monte Carlo to illustrate some of the points. Um, can we also use Bootstrap in order to, um, you know, avoid making an assumption about the distribution? Definitely, and, and definitely, we can use the exact same method, Monte Carlo experiments, to bootstrap the distribution of the estimation error. So that's definitely one way to do it, and we would understand whether the distribution has some properties that we can exploit. Uh, I completely agree. Uh, look, uh, these are, um, whether it is Monte Carlo experiments, cross-validation, bootstrapping, um, uh, resampling, there are many different uh, statistical approaches uh, that are well, very well understood in order to, un to uh, examine the mathematical properties of an approach. And let me make here a quick note. When we backtest something, we are not evaluating the mathematical properties of an approach. What we are evaluating is the profitability of a particular strategy in a particular historical scenario. But that's not Monte Carlo experiments, right? In Monte Carlo experiment, you are evaluating the mathematical properties of an approach under a very wide range of possible scenarios. So that's why uh, in this presentation, I have used uh, Monte Carlo experiments as opposed to a historical practice. Okay. And uh, another uh, questions on the methodology, uh, we talked about how to denoise the signal or reduce the amount of uh, 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 noise in the signal. How do you compare the approach that you described earlier with just an ensembles of optimization methods? Uh, yes. Do they complement each other? Do they uh, replace uh, each other? How would you use them? 
together if 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 it's a possibility to use them together of of course it's possible and i would encourage it so do not use nco alone right um okay. use nco and all the things so um you can uh, utilize nco and uh, combine it with the 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 methods the results that come from other methods like uh, hierarchical disparity maximum diversification portfolio other other portfolios and ensemble methods are very powerful in that they uh, reduce the risk of uh, overfitting right in sample overfitting um, so uh, the reason is is uh, very well known in the literature you can um, uh, see it in my first book in advances in financial machine learning i explain why uh, ensemble methods um, work very well in practice Okay, so now from this uh, rather specific questions on the methodology, something now a bit more broader as well, as this is also one that are quoted as uh, the liked question from the audience is about the concept of uh, machine learning, because there is the understanding that machine learning is an algorithm that learns from experience. You know, outside the financial industry, we've got the deep minds of a go and zero. And how does that apply into this machine learning within finance? What part of is it actually learn from experience? Yes, um, well, we have to distinguish between at least three forms of machine learning, right? The, the, the uh, simplest classification of machine learning is between unsupervised learning, supervised learning, and then reinforcement learning, right? Reinforcement learning doesn't really learn from experience. It learns from rules. You provide some rules and um, uh, AlphaGo, for instance, uh, derive algorithms just by playing against itself uh, without any human input, without any experience of, of uh, playing against an actual competitor. Um, there are other areas of machine learning where um, we learn from experience. So for instance, supervised learning, we provide examples to, to a particular algorithm. And the algorithm learns from those examples what are the features that are involved uh, that allow, allow you to separate cases and make accurate predictions. So that's a good example of um, a, a, a situation where the algorithm is actually learning from experience. And then you have unsupervised learning where it is not really learning about experience, it's just understanding the characteristics of the data. One example would be PCA, right? Or clustering algorithms. We're not actually passing labels and examples, but we learn the structure of the data. So within machine learning, you have these three fundamental uh, sections. In particular, in supervised learning, the objective is we are trying to predict uh, some outcomes based on some features that are involved in a phenomenon. And um, we are trying to learn those outcomes um, in, in a, in a non-parametric way, in, in most cases, in, in a way that we are, not in, we are not imposing our biases. We are just letting the algorithm figure out what is the function that approximates the outputs. Um, this, this, is not, uh, this does not require necessarily large amounts of data. When you go to Kaggle competitions in kaggle.com, you will find that there are many machine learning algorithms that are extremely effective, even in small data sets. The small data sets meaning a few hundred observations. Um, so, um, you know, many people tell me, yeah, but machine learning doesn't work in finance because our data sets are not large enough. Well, they are not large enough for applying deep learning in many cases. Uh, you cannot use successfully deep learning just for, with a few hundred observations. But there are many machine learning algorithms that can be extremely effective, even with the small data sets. And, uh, and random forest being a, a good example. So, so I, I would like people to be open-minded and not, and not make um, general statements. Uh, it, machine learning is a very rich field and some tools are very useful in finance, some tools will be less useful in finance. Yeah. So from the sounds of it, it is, uh, you know, uh, we should not be under the illusion that machine learning will solve all of our problems because, first of all, we need to understand what is it really our problems. Uh, we have some questions here, for example, about the usage of machine learning within other areas in finance, such as in futures or option trading within real estate. And if I may guess, the answer would really depend on the context that you're looking at, what kind of 
problem do you want to solve? And then the, the, the question is uh, whether you understand machine learning enough to know that it could solve your specific problem in that specific realm. But uh, I would also like to hear your opinion. Uh, uh, how widespread can we use different kind of machine learning techniques within finance? Are there specific areas where it might be um, unsuitable? Um, I don't think that, I cannot think of a specific areas where all of machine learning will be unsuitable. I think that there will be applications in portfolio construction as we can, we have seen. In trading, we know that's the case because, you know, high frequency trading relies on machine learning and, and it, it has been not only successful, it has become the only game in town, right? Uh, manual uh, market making is gone since 2008 or so. Um, uh, and, but there are many other applications, whether it's uh, credit ratings, um, of course, analysis of uh, text. You cannot analyze text through econometrics, unfortunately, right? You have to use machine learning. It's the, only, it's the only choice. If you want to extract sentiment from data or analyze satellite images or analyze email receipts, etc. cetera. Um, price prediction, in, in some cases, price prediction um, it, it can be improved through machine learning. In other cases, not, right? So price prediction is one area where I would invite caution. In some cases, uh, in some data sets, uh, machine learning will do a good job. In other data sets, you are better off with the classical methods. Um, risk analysis is other great area for machine learning because um, uh, risks are not symmetric. There are fat tails. Um, the distributions are very complex, et cetera, right? So there are all of these uh, applications of machine learning in finance. Let's not focus on price prediction. Price prediction is a very important application, but it's not the only application. Okay. Thank you, Marcos. We still have a lot of questions from our audience, but in the interest of time, uh, we're running slightly behind the schedule. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude the session today. I would like to thank uh, our participants today with all uh, with your attention and your great questions. Also, thank you, Marcos, for your explanations. It definitely opens up our mind and brings higher clarity for us, uh, either the novice or the expert in the machine learning on how to use it in real life in, within our industry. So with that, um, I would like to uh, say goodbye to all of you and thank you again for joining the session today. There will be recording of the session that will be shared with you online. And obviously you can find Marcos, um, if you Google him, you'll find him. And if you have further uh, questions, I'm sure there is a way to contact him, contact you, Marco. So thank you everyone. Have thank a good you. Day. Uh, thank you, it has been a pleasure and please stay safe.